welcome to The Horror Hangout, a podcast where film fans watch the best and worst horror movies of all time and talk about them. My name is Ben Errington, and today I'm joined by regular co-host, Mr. Andy Conjurit Turner. Hello, Ben. How are you doing? I'm good. Stifling a sneeze. Did, did, didn't need to sneeze in any any of the hours before we started recording. Hit record. Sneeze starts coming out. Oh, I'm all right. I've, I've, the pressure I've got of, live, of live broadcasting, I imagine. <clears throat> It sure is. I feel like if I was a newsreader or anything, I'd be sneezing. I reckon I'd just do like a throw a random belch in there just without thinking. Yeah, just throwing it out there. This is why we haven't been picked up by the BBC. And imagine, yeah, you don't see a BBC Sounds ad rolling before us, everybody. This is indie production forevermore. It's because they check and they go, you haven't paid your TV license in ages. I have. I have, of course. I'm not not a lawbreaker. But, uh, Abolish that TV license for God's sake! <laughs> Annoying. Yeah. Well, I watch as much of the day on on a uh, on catch up. Oh no! Now, you've, oh. Yeah, now they know you're watching as well. They've got you. Yeah, no, that's it. But <laughs> any one of those vans with a satellite dish like they implied existed in the eighties. Oh yeah, we've got a van and it just knows that you haven't got a TV license. What, what else does it know? Like about a, sat- a, sat- a satellite dish, like as oh, I've actually detected a TV. Literally, probably, if the van existed, just people looking in your window to see if you're watching EastEnders. That's oh, exactly what. Got that's you. exactly what it is. Yeah, it can't be. As it can't be a magic van. We'd know about it. Someone, someone on the inside would have been sacked, and they would have come out of all the secrets if that was true. Yeah, I love it. I love like just in fiction where there is like a detector to detect anything <laughs> so specific, whether it's you know televisions. Dragon Balls, other things exist. Like there's a thing I want to detect, a very, very specific detector. What, like uh Professor X when he detects all the mutants? That's different than it really. He's T- got touches his head, some some blue lines come off. And then we look to see all the mutants in the world. It's agony. Everyone's shush, be quiet. <clears throat> That'd be annoying. Um I'm that, annoyed. To TV licenses. What a what a terrible use of of a phenomenal power. Just sitting but there to... like, right, who has paid their television license? I can <laughs> see all this. <laughs> In in like there's got to be terrible X Men powers as well, right? I know we see s- some silly ones, but like just real bad ones, where, like that, like, oh, yeah, like very specific. Uh, very early in the animated series, which you can watch on Disney Plus now, I think, in the animated series of the original X Men, there is a bit where when they they go to an island, they meet some. They meet some mutants and some like local roustabouts are troubling some mutants. And some of them are like, no, I don't have any fancy mutant powers. And the two people that are getting picked on is a woman who just makes plants die, a woman who makes like pot plants die, and a guy well, that Well, has, I could do that. The guy that has glasses, the guy that has glasses and a big nose. It's like, I just look like this. This is <laughs> this is just my this is just my face. Where'd you get that ridiculous Groucho marks? <laughs> and at some point it's like that's a mutation. Like <laughs> that you've got glasses and a big nose. That that will happen. That will happen. And wh- where does it stop? What's a mutation and what's just you know, bad luck? Yeah. Who knows? Who knows? Not, not a fancy power. But anyway, um, <laughs> It's, but it's, anyway, <laughs> but it's uh, it's been another horrific week, Ben. We have been, if this insanity is anything to go by, it's because we've been up to the blooming eyeballs in fright fest preparation, right? Yeah, you said that was a bad week, not a bad week, but like busy you know, week, busy week, busy, <laughs> busy. It's terrible watching all these horror films. I'll tell you what, I don't, I don't, don't, don't want to tell you this. I know we do a weekly horror horror movie podcast, Andy, but I'm going to tell you this. I can't stand horror films. I oh, bloody hate them. <laughs> Find them too spooky. Ever so Find them too bloody spooky. What do you do? What do you do? Because there are a lot of people in the world who just go, oh, horror movies. Oh, can't handle it. Oh, can't. Bo-. And you, so, what, what do you say to that when somebody presents you with that? I, I sit down and say to them, now, you know, there's all kinds of vulnerabilities and weaknesses that are very acceptable. Um, you know, <laughs> Oh, you God. can be, you, you know, you can have uh, a physical weakness. You can have, um, you know, an, an emotional sensitivity. But like, if something's too spooky for you, I've got nobody time for you, mate. Get out, is what I say. Get out. You don't yeah, give them. No. A, a I don't slap. do that. Live, live, live your own lives. But you know, don't. I tell think them I always, scary. I always say, horror is a very complex genre, um, and maybe you're just not watching the right sort of horror movies. I feel like if you don't like the jump scares or you don't like the gore, 
There's plenty of other stuff you can find that that's going to be suitable. I think if you just write off the whole genre of horror, just oh, I can't deal with that now, and no, I don't like it. Then I think, yeah, just just seek out some other ones. It's like going, I don't like comedy, and it's like, well, some things will make you laugh. I don't like very... the laugh. Sorry, I hate it. I just hate joy. <laughs> I hate joy. I don't like any offbeat shenanigans or any nonsense. I just anything that makes me laugh against my will. I'm angry at that. I go, hang on a minute. How dare you make me feel something? That's not your choice. Yeah, taking away my free will. In the interest of a genuine answer, like talk to me recently was a good example. I had friends who were like, oh, I'm not really into horror movies. I find them a little bit too scary for me i don't enjoy myself and i said a little think about talk to me there are some scary things but what does it scares you? you don't like to be made jump you don't like you know the things to keep you up at night and i recommended they yeah. go and see talk to me anyway and they enjoyed it very much so based yeah, on that good. one example of a time i was right i will <laughs> i will take that forevermore that's like, that, that's what you gotta do you know you gotta latch on to these things i was right um, once i'm right forever thanks everybody you're welcome yeah. I think, unfortunately, like some people, if they don't watch a lot of horror, they've got a very sort of distinct idea of what horror is. And it is like the the most mainstream of horror movies. Um, and they're not always the best examples in the genre. So just look a little bit deeper, is what I say, without trying to sound like an absolute knobhead. But, you know, I can't help. I think that's just my natural demeanor. Just give it a chance. Give it a chance. Come on, everybody. Just give it a chance. Um, okay. So obviously we are not far away from fright fest we're watching we're watching movies we're preparing interviews that are going to be released fairly soon and we are attending the event as well live live we're, t- we're attending the event we're live from the red carpet um obviously we will be doing some interviews there as well as a special episode after the event but of course if you are attending uh, and you've ever listened to this podcast even if this is the first time you've listened to the podcast please seek us out We'll be the guys. How how would you describe? How would you find us? Would you say, Andy? Um. Well, you'll listen for our voices. I imagine if you don't know what we look like and you're not on the video, there's not pictures. Um. Just go into the sort of Leicester Square area over the Fright Fest period. Close your eyes. We'll, not in we'll the cinemas, lurking. obviously. We won't. When the film's running, absolutely <laughs> quiet. Quiet as a grave. We don't. Not quite as a what? Monsters, quiet as the grave because it's a horror podcast. <laughs> I like, thought uh, you said. I thought you said. Quiet as a grape. No, <laughs> grapes are also very quiet. That's a good example. Um, However, when you squeeze them, they do get a bit squeaky sometimes. Yeah, you can't do that. So unmolested grapes or the grave, <laughs> but as quiet as those two things um, when a film's running because we're not monsters. But out and about when there's chat to be had and this is a, just close your yeah. eyes. Listen Plus, to our voices. And then if we see anyone um, out there with their eyes closed trying to divine a location, we'll say, yeah. oh, they're looking for us and we'll come over and talk to you. That's true. I'm quite good. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, also, if if it's going to be me, Luke, and Andy together, you'll just see Andy flanked by two men who look quite similar, possibly with a hat on. So if you see a man of Andy's demeanour flanked by <laughs> two phonically two, challenged men. Two hatted men. Two hatted men. You'll know. We'll make sure we stand. We always stand in a certain, you know, it'll be Luke, Andy in the middle, then me on the right. Uh, we'll always stand in that. It's like Ant and Deck. They always stand as Ant and Deck, don't they? They don't stand the other way around. But in a more complex thing, we've got three of us. Far more complex, yeah. Okay, so apart from Fright Fest happening very soon, counting down to that, we've got some horror news. Starting with the Toxic Avenger remake. The first image and like a poster has been revealed and the news that it will premiere at Fantastic Fest in Austin, Texas on opening night. So September the 21st, I guess. Um, So this remake of the Troma classic, which obviously we covered on the podcast not that long ago. A horrible toxic accident transforms downtrodden janitor Winston Goose. Wait, have they changed his name? Winston Goose? (laughs) They changed his name to Winston Goose. Maybe it's a different character. Um, Into a new evolution of hero, the Toxic Avenger. Um, And of course, the Toxic Avenger Winston Goose is played by Peter Dinklage. Um, also stars Elijah Wood, Julia Davis, Kevin Bacon, and Jacob Tremblay. Um, a contemporary reimagining, apparently, of Toxic Avenger, but still rated R for violence and gore. So we're still expecting something to please fans of Trauma, even though, of course, Trauma aren't behind it yeah. as well. I'm, I'm looking forward to this. I've absorbed very little. Um, I've not looked at any 
images. I've not I'm not caught I'm not even sure there is a trailer, but I haven't watched the trailer. No. I'm just gonna go in and watch it, I think. Uh yeah, yeah, that's a good idea. I mean this image is you don't really see much, it's kind of like a silhouette of a thing. Wait, yeah, I, I wonder what they're gonna do with you know Peter Dinklage as the toxic Avenger. They're gonna is he voicing it and then he's gonna become a big giant toxic Avengerman? Yeah, maybe? that's a good that's a good question. I'm not entirely sure about that. Because original Toxie has one actor and and, and a voice. Yeah, right? I'm so... pretty sure. So from this image, I'm pretty sure that's Peter Dinklage as the Toxic Avenger. I'm pretty sure. I can't be 100% sure, but it looks to me like that's Peter Dinklage, I would say. Oh, if really I'm completely wrong, I can't wait. I'm, if I'm completely wrong, then I'm completely wrong. But, you know, I, I rarely am. No, I am. I'm 50% of the time, probably. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah. Look forward to that. We've also had the first look at the new Mike Flanagan Netflix series, The Fall of the House of Usher. Obviously, Mike Flanagan doing horror is kind of like becoming um, Netflix's yearly jaunt. Um, And yeah, The Fall of the House of Usher, of course, based on Edgar Allan Poe stuff. This eight hour limited series um, stars includes ruthless siblings, Roderick and Madeline Usher who have built Fortuno Pharmaceuticals into an empire of wealth, privilege, and power. But past secrets come to life when the hairs of the Usher dynasty dynasty, dynasty, start dying at the hands of a mysterious woman from their youth. Who's this mysterious woman from my youth? Ensemble cast, of course, it includes familiar faces from all of the stuff, Haunted the Hill House, all this stuff. Carlo Gugino, is that how you say her name? Um, But also Mary McDonnell, Mark Hamill, um, and then he loves his wife, doesn't he, Mike Flanagan? So yeah, she... another one of those one of those directors met his wife on a thing, and then uh, loves her, turns up in a lot of the stuff. And why wouldn't you? Yeah, of course you would. Kate, Kate Siegel's Siegel, very good it. as well. Yeah, Kate Siegel's great. Yeah, yeah, she's great. Um, I have seen obviously everything apart from the Midnight Club. Right, I've seen all but the last episode of the Midnight Club. It fell oh, in now. Into- it fell into that trap of Netflix once again, where I was enjoying it just fine. Maybe not as much as Midnight Mass or the previous ones, but I was enjoying it well enough. Mm. Um, but then understanding that it ends, I believe, setting up a follow-up, which was cancelled. That wasn't going to happen. The curse of Netflix once again. So- and the last piece of news I've got, which is a little bit of a a minor complaint. I'm going to make a complaint. Why? Out there into out there into the big wide world. So the the last boy, I'm going to get the ombudsman involved, right? Uh, the horror ombudsman, the last voyage of the Demeter, Demeter. I can't speak today, Andy. I would naturally say Demeter, but then I spoke to someone the other week who confidently corrected me that it's Demeter. So I'm going to go Demeter. with that. I'm going to try and learn and grow, Demeter. Yeah, so there's a news story saying it's underperformed at the box office, 6.5 million um, with its US release. But I think it's been released in other places as well. My complaint is they bloody went and pulled it from UK release schedules, didn't they? So they haven't helped themselves, number one. I don't know what the detail, what the thing was. But I'm really frustrated seeing horror fans from all over the world watching this movie and enjoying this movie or not enjoying it. I don't know. Um, why the hell has it been pulled from UK release schedules? What's going on? Do they think, do they actually have a chance? Because my complaint about that was, when they're talking about underperforming, why have you got a Dracula movie that that you've chosen? To, and I, I think in some territories, it's because a date in August is the date that in the diary of the original text of Dracula, that's when the boat runs aground. And I think it was released in some territories the day before mm. the date in the book that it ran aground. Well, it, it was it originally... Wasn't, that... It wasn't marketed as that, was it? So... Seems yeah, more coincidental. Kind of silly. It was it was supposed to be released on I think the eleventh of August in the UK. Um and it was on all schedules at the start of the month. Um, but then seemed to seem to just get pulled and then nobody seemed to have an answer as to why it wasn't get really I mean, if you're not listening to this podcast in the UK, then please take our complaints and, and just just ignore them. Just, just but... ignore them and feel better about your own situation. Say, oh, you know, I've got a hard life. Oh, hang on. At least voyage <laughs> Well, maybe you it is out in your country, and you've not even bothered to go and watch it. In that way, I think you just take, take those piss. fingers that you point in and look at those three pointing back at yourself. That's what Ben's saying. Um, <laughs> exactly. Yeah, so, yeah, I, I've heard the same, that it's underperforming. I've heard reviews of people saying that it's 
quite good. I've heard some other reviews yeah. of people saying, "What's Dracula doing on on a boat?" And I said, "Read a book for once in your life, you dickhead." But read um... a really, but he's never ever been on a boat. He's scared. He, he gets seasick. He does. He famously goes on the boat in that book. Um, but we don't see what happens on that boat, and it's a really cool and interesting idea. I'm disappointed well, they, we don't get they to They did see something it. in the BBC series, didn't they? On the boat. I didn't watch it because the last really. one was bad. Yeah. Um, oh god, I feel like I've deleted it from my brain, but there was definitely some stuff in a in a boat, on a boat, and uh, I can't remember if it was any good or not, but yeah. That's uh pretty pretty frustrating though that we don't get to see it. I'm kind of a bit frustrated because i would like i will see it when we can but my big complaint is that why have you got a dracula movie that you didn't just bring out at halloween august yeah. when it's up against the barbies and oppenheimers of the world yeah didn't seem That's like true. a good time yeah and i think cobweb also got released in the u.s the, the same weekend um it's, it's on demand now but that got released so it's almost like that is literally a film taking place at halloween it's like a build-up to halloween and halloween is perfect for that um, it seems kind of crazy that they wouldn't that they wouldn't do that. Um, yeah, it's diff- my my mum was like blaming me. She's like, oh, "Are we going to watch the last voyage of the Demeter soon?" I was like, "I think it's been pulled." She was like, "Excuse me," I said, "I think it's been pulled from release schedule." She's like, "Why? Tell me why." <laughs> I literally don't what know. You, what have you got to do with this, Ben? Was it because you weren't covering it? Is it because you weren't covering it? Ben, I know you're in charge of the horror movies, all right? Which one gets released and which one's like, yeah, I know, I know. Um, yeah. So Can you imagine if it came out, it was our fault. They were like, oh, yeah, we took a look and we saw the premier UK horror podcast, the Horror Hangout, weren't covering it as part of their August schedule. So, uh, But we would. Tell us and we will. We'll do it. Um, so get the director on. Get the director on. Um, yeah, so that's that. I guess we should move on to, well, unless there's any other horror news that you that you wanted to discuss no just what we've been watching which is going to be pretty sparse for me because i yeah don't want to spoil obviously i can give the list of the ongoing things we've i was gonna mention i was gonna just mention cobweb because i mentioned it there we are covering that obviously for fright fest but it is available on demand um now so obviously you can go and watch it despite the fact we'll be watching it at fright fest I've seen it as well, so I guess I'll just mention very briefly that it feels like a film. Yes, it should have come out in October because um, it's set set at Halloween. It's absolutely perfect. Lizzie Kaplan and Anthony Starr, Homelander himself, are the parents of a boy called Peter who's like hearing stuff in a wall, in a bloody wall. Um, Worst place to hear things. You know what? I got. Slight, I got a bit of malignant vibes from this. I'm not going to spoil anything major, but there's definitely. I mean, I, I if it took inspiration from malignant, I think that's great because I'd love to see. I didn't even really say malignant properly then. Malignant, I kind of went. Um, if it takes inspiration from, from that, I think it's good. Even though I wasn't like a huge fan of malignant, I think I still respect it for what it did. And I think some horror films probably should take note from that. That sometimes having a creepy creepy sort of horror film is good but occasionally doing something a bit nuts is also good so i would say that i i I wasn't like a huge huge fan of it but i respect it for what i tried tried to do and obviously we will discuss this on the on the fright fest episode the flight fest episode as well yeah i'm looking forward to getting there's been a lot to talk about on this so my watches apart from the film of the week have been exclusively fright fest stuff i'm doing my best to get through all of the content that the marketing teams have been kind enough to give us screeners Mm. for because there's no way with the best will in the world i could have eight eyes like a spider and i wouldn't be able to you still 70 movies that are on even if you had eight eyes eight eyes like a spider you can still only sit in one seat and watch one film at a time exactly and i don't want to do like a save by the bell double date things like saying oh hang on just need the toilet run to another cinema i can't be doing that mrs doubtfire yeah, can't be, can't be doing that. So, um, <laughs> really appreciate all of the distributors and marketing teams that have been good enough to send us screeners so we can do a little bit of pre watching. And pre watching, I have been. I'm not going to talk about them in any detail. We're putting the Fright Fest previews up. We obviously, you can also look these films up yourself if you want to catch trailers um, or a little bit of a breakdown. But so far in the last week, I've seen, well, the last week and a bit. 
Uh, so I've covered Thorns, Law, New Life, Isaac, My Mother's Eyes, The Glenarma Tapes, Cheat, and Werewolf Santa. So a big range of horror subgenres, a range of locations that they're being made from. Uh, you know, I love a bit of foreign cinema as well, Ben. There's been some other languages yeah. that we've got so many more to still cover before some we documentaries get there. To, to tackle as well. Um, Lots of good stuff. Really strong lineup this year. So I'm looking forward to talking about that. But it does yeah, definitely. limit the fruit from my what we've been watching section for the week as we've been focused on that content. The fruit. Uh, yeah, it happens and it happens. Um, I will the say the, the, the only other thing might be worth mentioning for me is I saw Teenage Mutant Ninja, Tur- Ninja Turtles, Mutant Mayhem. And the reason I'm going to mention that is because there's some stuff that we could be considered like body horror in this film. Okay. There's like, obviously, the animation style is incredibly, is incredible and really unique. And I was kind of worried that maybe it would be like, oh, it's kind of doing a Spider-Verse thing. But no, it's got this, re- it's, it's unique visual style. The teenage, the, the mutant Ninja Turtles are like probably one of the best representations of them as teenagers that has been around for a while even with like Raphael who I think sometimes when the turtles um kind of develops Raphael's character is very one note 35 he's fuming yeah what's he fuming about he's just fuming <laughs> um but with this they kind of do it and the voice cast is like unbelievable especially Jackie Chan as Splinter like great Absolutely great. Like, and the characterization of some of these, like the relationships that we're all familiar with. And I just love those sort of new, the new routes they went down and look, and the voice cast is stacked. So you'll be constantly going, Oh my God, is that? Yes, it is. Oh my God, is that? Yes, it is. Just a couple of examples. John Cena, Post Malone, uh, Paul Rudd. <laughs> like that's just mad, isn't it? That's, that's, just nuts. that's great. I need to but, hurry up and I need to hurry up and watch that. I have realised though, Ben, I did watch one other non Fright Fest movie. Okay. Uh, you may remember that um, a while ago I told you I watched The Collector um, about the horrible bloke who sets traps in people's houses. Oh, and yeah. Kills and captures them. Oh, I. I think my feedback on that was quite visceral. It's got like sore vibes to it, but he's ever so horrible. He's the most horrible little man you'd ever, you're ever going to see. He's a little fellow as well, is he? I think he's that little, he's average sized, but he's Dimin- um, diminutive. Yeah, little, but he's small man syndrome. But he's horrid, horrid, horrid bloke. He is. Um, so I watched the follow up to that, the collection. Um, oh, okay. Um, it expands it a little bit. Um, we get one of our surviving characters from the first one sort of pulled back into events. Um, it's horrible again. Horrible, <laughs> like, is. He's such a horrible, mean-spirited little bloke. Always trying to trap people. He's always got a plan for everything. Some uh, There are some bits that are ridiculous. In an opening scene, he goes at an entire nightclub, and I don't know how he's got the type of access to set the complexity of traps that he's built in this secret nightclub. Oh. But there's a bit where... Well... There's like lawn mowers go across the top of a dance floor. These blades just come and like no one, very few people on this dance floor because they're all too busy listening to their their dance music. Ben, their their oh. EDM, and they get absolutely mixed. so. You you know a lawnmower in the mix, and you go, "That's supposed to be there." Oh, hang on, it's building up. It's great to break down. They start to put their hands up, and then obviously getting your hands up when big blades are coming. Chop Bad you. Idea. So they get chopped. chopped. Um, and there's another bit where people get trapped in a nightclub corridor, and then. It's like uh like the rubbish like the garbage crusher in Star Wars. This big thing just comes down and squashes them all flat. Hasn't I, he got anything better to do, this guy? Get another hobby. Um but that this this is just almost in a cold open. I feel like someone should have probably gone for a record for the biggest body count in a horror film just based on a cold open. But then we get a more contained scene where he's got his base of operations where these people try and break in to rescue someone. Um mm. It's interesting. It's hugely over the top. Uh, the collector himself is horrible man, and um, yeah, it's horrible. Um, yeah, I would say it's worth a watch. Maybe we'll cover it one day because it certainly gives you a lot to talk about and maybe poke a lot of well natured fun at as well. So maybe we'll watch yeah. that in the future. Sounds good. Um, but that's yeah. that's it for me. Apart from the film du jour, the film of the week. Yeah, when did we do the first one of this? It wasn't that long ago, was it? Long time ago. Um, was it? Was- it? 
Well, I don't know. Time's a flat circle, I guess. But it was me and Luke, right? Because you were were you on on your holidays that time? Oh yeah. Oh, it was a long time ago. It was way back in episode 194. So over a hundred. Oh god, that's crazy. I was thinking. Oh, for some reason, I was thinking it wasn't that long ago. August 2021. So two years. Two years. There you go. Time flies. <laughs> Time yeah, flies when you're watching um, anthology horror series with charming, yeah, exactly. with charming little little animated, animated segues, which make it appear as if the film is, you know, targeted at children like the comic books were, but then mm-hmm. has just boobs in most of the in most of the scenes. Yeah, um, yeah, exactly. I, I was a bit creeped out by the animation. It's that animation style that makes it just feels a bit odd, a bit uncanny valley for me. Um, okay, so the film we're covering is Creep Show 2, uh, which is a 1987 American comedy horror anthology film directed by Michael Gornick and the sequel to Creep Show. Um, George A. Romero is the screenwriter, and it's what they're all based on short stories by Mr. Stephen King. Um, now this one, unlike the first film, only contains three stories when the first one contained five. I think there were two film, two other stories which were supposed to be included, but they were scrapped due to budgetary reasons. Uh, so it's three macabre tales from the latest issue of a boy's favorite comic book dealing with a vengeful wooden Native American, a monstrous blob in a lake, and an undying hitchhiker, uh, and some sexual assault. And <laughs> so... <laughs> In terms of uh, ratings, 6.0 on IMDb. Rotten Tomatoes, 29% critic score, 40, 41% audience score, 3.0 on Letterboxd, and some choice reviews. Elwood B says, Instant Karma, the movie. <laughs> four, four stars. <laughs> I think that's pretty much it, yeah. Um, Free Pizza says, two and a half, uh, sorry, says, passable, well-crafted for a run-of-the-mill horror anthology, but as a sequel... To one of the most entertaining genre movies ever, it's hard to dis- deny Peep Show. Creep Show. <laughs> Jesus. Playing the name game fair- early. It's a fairly big disappointment. Two and a half stars. Um, I think I did Peep Show for the last name game. Oh, no, I can't have done if I wasn't there. Oh, I don't know. Um, and then Thomas says the cheaper, shorter, less polished, less star studded sequel to the 1982 cult horror anthology two and a half stars and Michaela says corny 80s horror will always be top tier to me but then she's only given it three stars I say if you're going to rep- if you're going to call something top tier that's got to be f- four four and a half stars on onwards or, or follow up with your following with the sentence after that corny 80s horror will always be top tier for me but not in this example three stars <laughs> but not in this terrible example it's not a terrible example I'm not going to say that I quite bad. liked it yeah 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 I liked it too I liked it. I I would say. I mean, I, I'm trying to. I I know that some of the sequences in the original are like thought of as iconic. I think I enjoy this one just as much. Um, it's just yeah. I think it's the level of enjoyment is kind of fairly consistent. I say it maybe drops off in the last segment segment just a bit, just a bit, not too much. Um, even with yeah. the value that woman's getting of uh, dollars per orgasm. I mean that's. I got I got this dollars dollars for orgasm, right? I'm gonna say. Um interesting these, pricing these... model for the sex industry, I'd say. But we'll come to it. Interesting pricing model for the sex industry, but I feel like I don't want to shine a light on, on me personally. Everyone's different, right? Okay. So you might be like, right, I'm gonna go in there, six orgasms, bang, I'm gonna use my standard <laughs> method of ideology. That's not how it works. Everyone's individual. Everyone likes different things. You'll have to adjust. Your... I don't know whether this gigolo is good at, at thinking on his feet. Might be. These were the things I discussed when I was watching this. How would you hire a gigolo in the eighties? How'd you do it? Phone book. Phone book. What is it though? Cards in a phone box. That's a better example. Um. So Charlie, my partner, said, "Oh, they would just like lurk in hotel bars and stuff." Is it, is it, maybe it's just a big word of mouth thing, you know? Oh, you want to catch him? They, and then I was like, they lurk in hotel bars, but and and then put the charm on. But then I was like, yeah, but how would? W- at what point do you go? By the way, I know I'm coming on to you, but also I'm a gigolo, and here are my rates. <laughs> it's probably the same, Ben. You 
done your share of freelance work at the time. At what point do you? <laughs> well, what time do you say? Um, oh yeah, I'm a good. I'm a I'm a good graphic designer actually. Look at some of the logos I've done. So goes, oh, if you do a logo for my podcast, and they say, well, I know I said I can do this, and I'm like, here's here's a low res of what I can do, but I'm afraid it is gonna it is gonna. I do. Attach, attach, a, money. attach a price list. I mean, it will put people off. Some people to go, what? Paying you for your time and efforts? No. Um, but yeah, as a gigolo, I think that's going to put people off. Especially like an older married woman might be thinking, oh, my sex life's a bit stagnant. I'm finally, uh, it makes me feel good because I finally feel like um, I'm still attractive and somebody's coming on to me and it's given me, a, I feel rejuvenated and maybe I'm just going to go back to my normal relationship and, and, sa- and salvage it. By the way, 50 quid per orgasm. <laughs> and then you go, whoa, 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 whoa. Yeah, I'm every... rethinking it all. Oh. Yeah, like, who knows? Who knows when they can introduce that? And, like, is it is it a lot of work? Um, obviously, once she's been a customer once, repeat customer is going to be where he gets a lot of his day-to-day. That's um, true. Assuming he's done a good job. But how does he how does he get them the first time? Is it a... Um... <laughs> Is it? Is he got testimonials? Would you mind signing something to that effect? You know, when she's saying twenty five dollars per orgasm, six that is money well spent. Do you reckon he goes? Would you mind just give us a little write up on this? You know, Miss X, Supreme Chief Justice, or whatever her job is. Six is a lot as well, isn't it? I mean, I know they, I know it works differently for men and women, but. If I was on the receiving end of six, I'd be finished for. <laughs> you, I'd be a costume of a man, and you wouldn't see me again in public for two weeks. I reckon. <laughs> I'd look like uh, I'd look like uh, Imhotep in in the Mummy when he's all reverse Imhotep. That you need to go and slurp some archaeologists dry. I need to go, I need to go and drink some pineapple juice immediately to get my anyway. Anyway, yeah, we'll, we'll come to that one. That's the last story. Where do we where do we begin? Or do that is to... the last story. Um, yeah. So obviously, this is an anthology that is directed by Michael Gornick, who is the cinematographer of um, the first film, and I think he did some stuff for George A. Romero as well. Day of the Dead, possibly cinematographer, and they've gone. Oh, you're good at cinematography. Have you ever thought about directing? And he's gone. Actually, I'll yes. have a go at this. Is Tom um, Savini the creep? I think Tom Savini plays the creep. Maybe someone else does the voice, though, apparently, I read. Definitely in the first sequence. Yeah, Joe Silver does the voice of the creep. So, obviously, Tom Savini, for some reason. Well, I don't know. Maybe they had the voice first, and they were like, we need a Tom Savini to get in. To and be do delivering, delivering these things with, like, looking like a slim Peter Griffin with your ball there's, chin. Also, there's absolutely no way. Like if this guy turned up delivering comic books, you you wouldn't go, oh, all right, mate. Yeah, comic books. You go, what is going on? You, I mean, it's, it sounds a bit mean. I wouldn't, I wouldn't do it to someone who was, was, was physically, um, <laughs> who had some sort of physical ailment. However, this guy looks terrifying, and he's what a distribution model. He's not from the publisher that's bringing all of the comics that and and magazines that that publisher. He appears to be just delivering creep show. Yeah, exactly. Straight to the, straight to the source. Um, you watched Tales from the Dark Side recently as well, didn't you? So you've already I did watched like a another sort of anthology from the same sort of era, nineteen ninety. Yeah. yeah, I I love so like three years later. I love these. I love both. I I really liked. Now I think about it, Tales from the Dark Side. I liked an awful lot. Um, mm. and the same is true with um Trilogy of Terror one and two. Like I love these anthologies of this era. Can't get enough mm. of them. So well up I was well up for some creep show. I was like young Billy, riding my bicycle along, waiting for the, the creep to come and deliver me. Another little another little issue of his stories. And is this the first time you've seen this as well? Uh I've seen it years ago. I've not seen it for a okay. little while. I've seen the first one more times, mostly the Ted Danson holding his breath story. Um <laughs> yeah. but this one I'm very familiar with the middle, the uh, the middle chapter, but um, less the middle chapter, it. yeah, the middle, the middle chapter is intense. What is that? It looks like a tarpaulin. The blob creature looks like a tarpaulin with a load of old remnants of a barbecue on it. It looks like there's been someone's had a barbecue, wrapped cleaned up in it. a tarpaulin, wrapped, cleaned it, wrapped up in a tarpaulin, and slung it onto the lake. So yeah, now it's come to life. It's trying to get, it's trying to get you. Um, 
Yeah, but we'll come to that though. Let's shall we dive yeah, in on sorry, the first, we'll like dive it. in on the first one. I know I, you love those third, third ones. Let's let's not do dirty on the first story. Oh yeah, the first good story old, is great as well. Yeah, definitely. Good um, old Steve so, Woodenhead, and then the the wraparound story. Billy has opened his comic, and it which switches from a little boy getting uh, a magazine to a cartoon version of him, a very off brand. It's not like a you know. It, it has a style to it, but I am afraid, unfortunately, I'm not well versed enough in animation styles to be able to pull the name of the animation mm-hmm. house that does it. It's got a good 90s independent or late 80s, 90s independent kind of vibe. Like films such as my t- cultural, cultural touch point of that is Sparky's Magic Piano. It looks a lot like that. Um, <laughs> it, go- it goes to that. Um, it reminded me of there was like an animated version of Lion Witch in the Wardrobe, which I had on VHS. I used to watch as a kid, Sparky's Magic Piano. Yeah, it's almost like, yeah, I think you're right with the, the animation style. Yeah, so it's it's like this, and then we hear uh, the creeper becomes a lot more animated when he's an animated character, not a man in like a a pair of overalls and a mask. And he introduced us to the first story, which is all about your friend and mine, Chief Woodenhead. Old Chief Woodenhead. Um. So, yeah, of course, we're introduced to a pair of characters, Ray and Martha Spruce, an elderly couple who run a small town general store. Um, But the town, which is called Dead River, something like that. Yeah. Is is gone to the dogs. There's no no one around. They haven't had a a paying customer for four days. And before that, they said it was four weeks since someone's paid on credit. Gone to the dogs. They're obviously not. They're obviously losing more money. And they're getting to that point in their lives as well where, you know, they're probably thinking about retiring. And Martha's kind of like trying to say to Ray, we should probably just close the store, give up. And Ray's um, ever so nice about it. It's like, hey, this store, like, it may feel like a burden, but this paid for us to get married. It helped our kids go to college. And, you know, it's given us the yeah. savings to be able to support this town. What a lovely, what a lovely couple. These are, Stephen King has gone out of his way to go, right, Who's the loveliest couple I can write? Who's the, the most... loveliest couple you I know. never want anything bad to happen to these people? The spruces, the spruce moose. Um, and of course, they've got a sir, like an, a Native American, um, like stat wooden statue guy, old chief Woodenhead, outside the front of the store. So, a cigar store Indian is like an advertisement figurine in the likeness of like a Native American or something else, um, usually used to represent that you sell tobacco. What's that? You want some tobacco? Just have a look for the Native American little statue anywhere. It must be an Amer- getting, must some be an Amer- getting some darts. must be an American thing because obviously we don't really get that in in the UK. In the UK, you'll get um, a crackhead. No, that's mean. I'm sorry. Uh- <laughs> Standing outside of news agents, berating you as you come in, and you go, "Oh yeah." It's been so long since like any cigarette advertising was allowed in this country. I cannot, for the life of me, remember what it used to be. Yeah, I don't know. I think it just used to be just all shops just sold them. Yeah, you say that, but like some companies still like do adverts for everything but tobacco so like the other day i was stood at a news agent and there was like a screen behind the news agents of like an animated advert and i was like whoa what's going on here it was like things flying in and just like stuff and it was for rizzler and i was like hang on a minute other uh, other cigarette papers are available however i was like yeah but that well, that can't be for anything other than smoking a dart or 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 a bit of the old mary jane so yeah oh, yeah it's um i mean you 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 can use them for all. If you need to blow your nose, but only a tiny little bit, be all right. <laughs> yeah, um, a little you... sleeping a sleeping bag for a tiny little centipede. Yeah, or if you need, um, if you specifically want to put them in like a hollowed out bit of buyer and gob them at people at school, it'd be very good for that, I'd imagine. It would. Um, so yeah, pretty much everything tobacco or cigarettes wise in the UK now is just like hidden. Um, you can't even see like anything essentially it's like oh have you got any uh got any of uh, this and then they go it's, it's like package less stuff sometimes yeah and like That's literally stuff. like you know they, they go more and more extreme with like the health warnings on on those as well i, I don't there's just, just be a dead body there's just be a dead body dead body with like this will be you and then this on the will other be side, you the if other you side don't of the thing, stop the other side of it they says if you see me holding this box, it's because I'm a massive cunt. And like, oh, <laughs> Nonces smoke. 
<laughs> yeah, like we've run it, we've we've run it past legal. As long as you can prove at least one nonce smokes, then that's true. Yeah, that's it. Nonces smoke, and it'll be a, there will be small print, but it's so small that yeah. there's no point being there. Um, <laughs> Pictures of famous people that loved a cigarette, Hitler, Stalin, like all these. Bad <laughs> I don't know if he did that. I might be besmirching his otherwise yeah. flawless reputation if he's never that's smoked. True. Thankfully, he's done loads of other shitty things. So yeah, um, yes, yes. Um, um, so obviously, Ray is like painting the the cigar store. He's touching, up his, he's touching up his touching paint up his paint. war paint, yeah. Um, because he says, "Oh, he's been bleached by the sun or something." So it seems like he's he's still taking care of like the entrance to the store, and he wants people to come in. But it seems like there, there's like, is it, do they say that there's like an a local Native American tribe led by the elder Benjamin White Moon? And for some reason, they owe a lot of money to the, to yeah, Ray, the I general mean, store. The, They've been the town was once thriving, and it's not doing mm. so well. So everyone's on hard times. So the yeah. local Native American like population, led by Benjamin Uncle Ben, as it were, um, oh, the, the only bit of media in which Uncle Ben is one of the few characters that doesn't die. Um, yeah. So un- Uncle Benjamin. Um, comes along as a representation and Martha is a little bit skeptical so are you they they've really taken advantage of you you give people so too what, much credit I guess so what they do they must have been doing is going look we're all on hard times we're skin but we're gonna need a B and C from your store and, and Ray's obviously gone so oh, yeah, gets like right. tools and back. materials right for them yeah. to do their jobs like whether they're farming pay me back. or building yeah pay me back when you got it and he's come and he's brought along some jewelry and other treasures his tribe's sacred treasures that they've collated from everybody to kind of say, this is collateral for the debt that we've incurred. If we can't pay, don't you say if we can't pay in two autumns? Yeah, then... so two years, then sell it and that will cover I, your how cost. Much, how much they bloody owe? Yeah, I'm guessing it's just to have all this treasure because it will more than pay for it, right? Because later on, someone says there's like 10 grand's uh, worth. Yeah, of... 10 grand's worth. I look at it there. Do you not look at it and go... I won't believe it. If someone said this is worth ten grand, I'd be like, "Well, go and sell it for ten grand and come back with a ten grand." Because I'm not, I'm not interested in being your middleman for getting rid of this jewelry. Yeah, I'm Ray, not going Ray, on Antiques Roadshow anytime Old Ray soon. and Martha, not such mercenaries as as modern days Ben Errington, though they <laughs> understand the cultural relevance yeah. of these treasures, and they say, "Ray, what a nice man!" And again, this really pulls on the heartstrings. It builds these characters up so well as like literally. The most uncomplicatedly nice people. It's like, I can't accept these treasures, and then he takes it back to Ben, who's walking away. Um, yeah, not not mercenary capitalist Ben Errington, but kind. Uh, oh, slung on a wise. trashy. No one. Yeah, this 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 guy, Uncle Uncle Benjamin, turns around and says, "Hey, you know what? It's bad to be in debt, but it's worse to be a beggar. So I we want to give you these treasures, and you keep them safe, and that gives us a chance to." Mark that we have this debt to you. We'll pay it back, and we will get these get these treasures back. And if not, we have given you something of value. So you didn't just give us this as charity. And mm. they've, they've agreed. And Ray says, "I will guard these treasures with with my life." And... Oh, guard them with my life, exactly. Um, quite literally. <laughs> and well. we get and we get another scene where like Martha comes comes along and says to Ben, uh, "You know what? I was just saying to my husband that." give people too much credit and you're too cynical you're not cynical enough about the world and actually that people will take advantage of you and it's bad and you they're not not bad ben from the future who threw who's throwing these treasures on the slack on the scrap heap you good ben <laughs> from ben. this film um you've you've proved me wrong and i'm so happy to be wrong and he gives them a little smile i am co- i'm completely my confidence in humanity has been fully restored um, I love everyone. I love Dead River, and I think we're gonna have a great time here. And I was a little bit cynical earlier, but now I feel great. Until they is it go... supposed to? Is it like later that night? Because it I feels like later it's... that evening. Yeah, it feels like there's a weird transition. It feels almost like from the cutting. It feels like they've walked back into the shop and these guys. Yeah, and... there's a couple of weird transitions in this film where like there's just like a wobble. The screen like wobbles to to signify that time has passed. Um, which is kind of which is kind of weird. I mean, it works, but it's still kind of weird. Um, and just randomly, for some reason, a trio of like, 
what would you say? Nobeds. Yeah, bad, bad, bad blokes. There's the leader, and then his two sidekicks, Rich Boy and Fatso. Rich Boy and Fatso. Um, and the leader is like a Native American character, an estranged nephew of Benjamin, but definitely played by a white fella, right? Oh, I never even thought of that. I took it at face value. <laughs> Hundred percent, because I recognised him because he's from Mind Hunter. Um, is it Short Circuit <laughs> Two all over again? <laughs> it is. So it's Ho- I think it's Holt Holt McCallany. Um, so if you just search Holt McCallany, you will see he is just he, he's not got long <laughs> long hair, and he's definitely I'm pretty sure. Well, I don't want to assume just by the way someone looks what their ethnicity is, but I was definitely getting that vibe. That they've gone. Listen, listen. We need we we go. We need like a Native American character. Um, yeah. I'm just looking at his his life growing up. It didn't say anything. Yeah. So that that's dodgy. He's got a super chip on his shoulder. He's like definitely a psychopath because he's like in love with himself. Um, in love with his own hair, and for some reason wants to murder. Well, I don't think he initially wants to murder, but for some reason has got a, because they kicked him out of the shop for like stealing. Like a, a while ago, yeah. He goes, and like, I now he's come back with a shotgun. You, you told me I had to leave. He says, yeah, because you were literally stealing. You got off pretty lightly. Well, if I can't steal in this day and age, then the world's gone mad. Political correctness gone mad. If I can't steal, if you um, ask me to leave for stealing, what about my rights to be in this shop? My rights. I, I got rights to steal, and he's obsessed with like going to live in Hollywood. If I was his mate, I'd just be like, shut up about going to Hollywood. Either you go to Hollywood on your own. And and make a, make a go of it, whatever whatever you want to do. Are you saying you want to act? I can't tell because you can't just turn up with a shotgun to an audition and say, "Listen, right, yeah, let us in Hollywood, <laughs> please." And also, if I was his mate, right, if, if we move to Hollywood and we're all reinventing ourselves, and you're going to be a Hollywood star, can I have a better name than Fatso? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think he calls him Fatso, and then he calls him something else a bit later, which is fat just stuff. Like, yeah, yeah, that's it, fat stuff. Can I have a better name than Fatso? Well, we got. Fat stuff for you lined up. Oh well, I'm not sure I like that one either. Well, you get what you're given. <laughs> like, uh, it's not the so or the stuff that I had a problem with. Like, you know, yes, I am a huskier gentleman, but could you not call me just? My name's Michael. <laughs> <laughs> My name's Michael. He is a bit of a knob, though, to be fair. So I think he's fully, it's fully fine for him to be on the receiving end of this. Although I think they're both obviously coerced by um, what's his face, the the man. <laughs> the man, Sam Hollywood. White Moon, Sam White yeah. Moon, uh, Andy and Vince are called the other two guys. So we've got an Andy and a Ben in this film. Oh, we're, we're, yeah. we're, and unfortunately, I get to be the well, fortunately for me, I get to be nice feature Andy, whereas I'm bad in this film. Like, yeah, that's sake. what happens. And I'm and I'm bad in the future, is what you're saying. Um, <laughs> yeah, because so you don't value they're, the treasures. <laughs> they're like terrorizing these two, these two for like no real reason. For tipping potatoes on the floor like saying oh we've we there's nothing really to rob there's no cash we're just taking a few things we've kind of just having a few snacks off. Uh, having yeah. a few snacks having to go in the photo booth where he takes photos of himself sam does and then proper fancies himself he's like they'll I see this, look- they'll see this lovely hair and they'll be like yes get in hollywood mate get in front of that camera and i'm thinking that's not a you can't just get in hollywood based on hair alone can you is anyone in hollywood based on hair alone I reckon you've got to say words in the right order as well. <laughs> I mean, some people, there's a lot of nepotism, of course, in Hollywood. Um, but I don't know if hair alone is going to cut it. So, yeah, he's kind of terrorizing everyone. He sends he sends off the, the, the rich guy to go and get the car because we're going to Hollywood tonight, which is mad as well. Yeah, and he, like, he kind he of is, accelerates that... their plans after he... He knows that the treasures from Uncle Ben are there. And he goes, give us them treasures, will you? That'll get us a long way in Hollywood. Oh, yeah. Famously cost a living real low over there. Um, he's got to get... go to, he's got to go to like the pawn shop though, with the guy who's like, best I could do for you is, <laughs> he's got to go and do that. He's got to go for that process, which is annoying. Um, so yeah, he wants that, but in the, in the frustration, he threatens plenty of times, but he, it feels like it's almost accidental in the first book. He's just getting frustrated, but then yeah, I am co- he I accelerates straight that, from yeah. oh, I've made a mistake here to right, let's do a double murder, eh? In for a penny, in for a pound. So he accidentally it's... shoots Martha. 
But why is, why is it loaded? This is the thing, right? Like, why would it need to be loaded and cocked, ready to go? Just, yeah. <laughs> and I'm pretty sure like a shotgun takes a pretty significant amount of squeezing. Takes a little know. bit of a, a little bit of a squeeze on a hair trigger. Obviously, it go it oh, goes okay. off. Thankfully, it only cinema shoots them, and she just has a little bit of red on it and slowly yeah. falls to the floor. Um, yeah, because shotgun from that range would ev- eviscerate her probably. <laughs> But he, he shoots he shoots Ray as well, and then that's it, isn't it? Like, oh, that, it's ever so sad. I don't know this is a throwaway little bit of thing, but like these two old yeah, people sad. have like collapsed down, sort of reaching for each other over the, you know, over the goods that they've fallen on top of, mm. and those Rongans head off, getting ready to go to Hollywood that night. But then, and we we already saw a little bit of this. I forgot to. Oh no, this is later that he. Makes a little move like the uh, chief Uncle Benjamin says goodbye to the chief earlier on. He, he also talks to Chief Woodenhead, yeah. but um, as they as they leave and go, we see some movement in Chief Woodenhead, and yeah, reaches up into the pot of paint that has been spilled because um, Sam shoots the paint the and, slowest. Yeah, he reaches down and he puts on his war paint. And I kept thinking, do he ever cheat then, for God's sake? But obviously, he didn't have the logistics to like either get to the other the, hand in. To move the other hand. That was because that was holding a holding a holding a bow and arrow. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So a straightforward oh, bit of revenge from here, right? A lovely action scene. Yeah, and as we said, as we already said, um, instant karma in the movie. That's one hundred percent what it is. Obviously, everybody else has gone off to get their bits and bobs together for for the Hollywood trip. Um. Uh. And yeah, he, first of all, he goes after Vince, who's Fatso. Fatso, I'd be annoyed if I was Sam going, go and get your stuff. And he's gone home and he's having a, he's having some chicken nuggets and watching a Western. Yeah, we're on a bit of a time schedule. It's sit and watch a Western. But unfortunately, we all know we all know someone like that, don't we? Go in there and get showered. I'll see you in a minute. And then you come in and go, have you had your shower? Oh, no, I'm just playing a bit of GTA first. You idiot. We got to go. <laughs> what are you doing? I didn't what say go doing? and have a sit down, did I? Your twat. So he just gets shot like, I guess, old Chief Woodenhead's off screen and shoots him with multiple arrows. Um, then he goes to the rich kid's house, trashes his car first, getting where it hurts. Teach him a lesson. And then we see like a dad silhouette. Bought him a, dad bought him a T-bird. That was what Sam was going <laughs> on about. Yeah. And then we see like a silhouette of him, like tomahawking him to death. Um, and then when he goes and gets Sam... Again, Sam's like just he put he's the only one who puts up a bit of a fight, I guess, because with a shotgun and <laughs> that he's still been carrying this whole time, just walking around his house with a fully cocked shotgun. Fully cocked shotgun, ready to go. Like, oh, I might accidentally kill someone else. I've got a taste for it now. I've killed two people. Who knows? There's got to be another very, one very Moorish this kill. It's like Pringles. It is. Um, yeah, and he gets scalped. So his 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 hair that he loves so much is ripped from his head with his scalp. Uh and Chief Woodenhead the next morning returns to his statued position. His, his, Before that, his... he puts the treasures. Obviously, he gets the treasures back. Oh, and... of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I guess this is what prompts Uncle Ben, the survivor of this story, um, to go to the shop because he wakes up in the morning and his treasures, the family's treasures that he's left to, with Ray for safekeeping, mm. uh, on his bed. Obviously confused. Yeah, you'd be, like, you'd be like, oh, ungrateful. So he goes, he goes back for some reason. He senses something's amiss. So he goes back to the store. Um, he doesn't go in and, I imagine, see the terrible scene of murder. Maybe, maybe the chief left him a note. Um, but he goes. <laughs> yeah, he doesn't. He doesn't go in, does he? No. He just. He just goes to the store, and meets eyes with Chief Woodenhead, <laughs> who's who holding has, the scalp. <laughs> who has the scalp of his treacherous nephew in his hand? And he he just kind of looks at him and gives him a nod of recognition, and the chief nods back. He goes. Scalped him, did you? Does the chief nod back? I'm not sure if he nods then or when when Benjamin says goodbye to him as he leaves after giving the treasures, and the chief goes, Nice move. Nice move. He he was he was absolutely crying out for a scalping. Yeah, I think um, at, at some point, whether when he gave gives over the treasure or when he goes back, the chief makes just the slightest of nods to him and he kind of looks twice, but he hmm. he goes back and he sees the chief with a nod of recognition. And then this is where we get at the end of each of the stories, 
and it and it does play very well. Like I think in a film, if it was a film as a standalone, you would think I need a little bit more of a conclusion than that. But in a stinger, a short story comic like this, it just transitions back to the creeper. He's a back to the animated thing as well. Who like yeah. goes and it, it goes to almost like a comic panel where we see the creeper yeah. and it freeze frames and makes into a cartoon style the the final shot as if it's the final co- panel of a comic comes out and the chief does not the chief the creep does like a little pun like it says but he getting your air off in hollywood <laughs> he got his air off didn't he, he lost his temper yeah, yeah. Um, oh, well, what, what a lovely what? end to Look a story guy. but let his hair down <laughs> uh two elderly folks are dead but that was a lovely end to that a story. lovely story because the people that killed them have also now been murdered so good they have also now been deaded and i yeah, guess uh, that that you know the debt's clear now, right? Who do you owe, de- who do you owe money to? Oh, yeah, but I bet he's secretly relieved. I want to know what happens to the the chief now. Like, where's he? Like, where's he going to go and stay? It's true. It's true. He's just going to chill there. He'll, someone will snap him up. He'll end what up on that pa- pawn shop TV show. Yeah. Oh, best I can give it. This is a this uh, alleged to come to life. There's still blokes hair in his hand that was that murdered him. He, he... Uh, it could be anyone's hair. I, I give you anyone's there. If you can authentic if you can authenticate that hair, then I'll give you an extra fifty. Okay. I'll got I got I got a specialist on the phone. I'll go and get him back. And he always rings up his uh specialist same mate. that very that same mate who's a specialist. I got I got a guy who knows him. And a camera crew's bit. at his place. <laughs> yeah, yeah. As <laughs> as like? the phone rings. As the phone rings. <laughs> All right. <laughs> you again. I wondered why this camera crew was here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Stop ringing me every day. I got a day job here. Um Okay, so uh, with the little animated segue bit, animated interlude, sorry, now we get the boy receiving a package at the post office. Yeah, that apparently he's paid nine ninety nine for that in nineteen eighty seven money. That's pricey. It's half house. He's paid for it, and I bet he's waited ages for it to arrive. Cash on delivery, though. He had to pay the postman, the postmaster. Oh, okay. Um, so it's a oh, product we, that was before advertised. Move on to the next the product, though. Um, yeah. Overall, overall thoughts on the story. We'll do full review at the end, but strong segment. What a what, yeah, how do they think it's a starter? I think it's a strong segment. Um, I think perhaps the, well, I mean the characters who who he gets revenge on were suitably, like dislikable, and old Chief Woodenhead. They didn't try to make it go too crazy. Like we like saw him kill someone off screen, then we see like a silhouette, and then eventually we see him. I think that was good. It was paced nicely. Uh, yeah. I think it's effective. And which which one of the baddies did you hate the most? Ben, bearing in mind this reflects very heavily on you. I mean, there's only one. There's only one you can really hate the most, isn't there? Sam Whitemoon with his with his locks because he was a, a genuine psychopath. He loved himself. We all know someone like that. Yeah, um, I'm anti rich boy myself. I was like, come oh, on, anti rich. Oh yeah, that's true. Because technically, you had the resources to make a difference yeah. there, rich boy. What what and are you you've doing? You've only gone and murdered. Yeah. I mean, they're all twats, aren't they, really? Even fat, so even fat stuff. Yeah, and he doesn't help himself, does he? I mean, he's he's already got a name like fat stuff, and he's piling away the Twinkies when he's in the shop. He's creep appears from behind the post office counter. What were you doing back there, creep? And he begins the next story, which is called The Raft. The now, Raft. I kind of remember this one, so it made mm-hmm. me think, Do I, have I seen Creep Show 2 before? Maybe. I remembered some stuff about it. Um. But yeah, I I thought this one was pretty good as well. Well, well sorry, I'll do the, do the setup for it. So it's like mid October, which initially I was like mid October, going for a going for a swim in your budgie smugglers. What no, they've done you. there is they've taken the same approach to their activities as the um, distribution company behind Last Voyage of the Demeter have done to a release time. They've gone, <laughs> but the opposite. Whereas they have done something in summer that uh, the uh, summer activity they're doing it. A yeah. week away from Halloween, rather than the other way around, doing something that should be Halloween in October in August. Yes, madness. So we've they've, got deep. They're reversed. They've 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 flipped it over time and space. It's madness, isn't it? So it's Deke, Laverne, Randy, and Rachel. Good they names. Arrive at strong Cas- names. Definitely Laverne. good names. Could be a band there. Um, they arrive at Cascade Beach. Oh, beach, beach or beach or lake. So a desolate lake, far from civilization, for some fun. 
when they're driving there, they're smoking smoking a doobie. So they're clearly all... getting those getting the devil's lettuce on them. Getting the devil's lettuce on them. Weird, because they end up in the water swimming, and then when they arrive on the raft, they pull out another doobie. I'm like, hang on a minute, where was that stored? <laughs> yeah, have you got have you got like a dry bag with you? A dry bag. Um, so essentially they all get in the water and decide to swim out. There's like a wooden raft in the middle of the lake, one of those floaty raft things. Um, why did I the girls... I had a little bit of culture clash here because the guy was like, hey, be careful. That's like, that's 45 degrees, 50 at best. And I was like, that's bloody hot. Boiling. <laughs> that's <laughs> that's, that's the hottest up, water I've ever encountered. Um, so I had to do a quick conversion for anywhere that uses Celsius. Uh, that is 10 yeah. degrees. Yeah, 10 degrees. That's 10 degrees. I, mean, I was like, fair enough, that's cold. That's cold. That's uh, a cold water. Yeah, 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 definitely. You, at the sea, did... you'd accept it, right? You'd be like, oh, that's the that's cold like the sea. But you wouldn't wouldn't have a bath in a 10 degree. No. no, no. I'd be fuming about that. I'd be like, oh, come on, warm it up. Chuck a bit of hot in there. Why did the women get in fully clothed? Just because they're cold. Is that is that what they say? Or do they about... go... Don't be looking at us, you dirty bastard. I was about to say, is it going to be a, like they're trying to keep the rating down? But no, because we get people naked shortly after. Yeah. So they thought they're just, I guess they're out of clothes there. Maybe they plan to get changed into a total dry set after they've had a swim. Yeah, possibly. Because the fellas get down into their little tighty shorts and little budgie smugglers. So, so they're fine doing it. Um. So essentially, yeah, when they swim out, Randy, as he's swimming out, he sees like a duck like pecking at something on the surface of the water and then it seems to get pulled underwater. Oh yeah, and the poor all... ducks. Get poor ducky. Up, poor duckling getting slurped off. And then when they're all jumping in, Randy, when they're all swimming over, Randy sees something and he's like, right, okay, what the hell is that? It's moving towards. I can't really see what it is. And he sort of panics getting everybody onto the raft quickly. Oh, getting them out of the water. Just, yeah, he starts panicking. and says, oh, okay, everyone get out. His mate though. No such like he's like, come on, let me wait. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uncle Don't Trish. piss about. Don't <laughs> yeah, piss about yeah. for God's sake. He's like everyone. <laughs> he does a proper uncle knobhead. He's like, oh, I'll be out. No, it went really up. Yeah. <laughs> and then I feel like this could have all. This could have equally just been a bit of the production because the first girl. It's not Laverne. It's the other one, right? Um, who he, who he goes to lift out, Rachel. and then she, Rachel gets her knee bashed on the side. She goes. Oh, Fucking me, you dickhead! <laughs> Ow, <that> could... <laughs> really genuine dialogue, like, "Oh, you pissed about a bastard!" Straight my knee now, you prick. <laughs> so when they, so when they all get onto the raft, because obviously Laverne is swimming a bit slowly, and there's like a moment where you think the blob, this blob thing's gonna get her. So there's a blob thing floating on top of the water. Yeah, it kind of resembles an oil slick. Because I think they say, "Oh, it's an oil slick," and then Randy's like, "I've seen an oil slick before." <laughs> it's I not can... that. I can remember all the times I've seen an oil slick and it's not that. Um, and yeah, it's, it's got like weird bits in it. And I guess it's like body parts from different yeah. things it's been eaten. It's some it looks sort like of... it's been, it, it looks like some, a, a, a canister of Noel's house party gunge has escaped yeah. and been lost lost in the river. Like traditional, like Captain Planet style toxic waste effectively is what it yeah. is. It doesn't look pleasant. Um, and, and things get started pretty much immediately is that where they're all sort of like looking at it and discussing what it could be, Deke sort of taking the piss saying like, oh, it's nothing, don't worry about it, you bloody Doesn't whip. It, when, um, when Randy is talking about having done some conservation work with all slicks and the other, and Deke gives them some jip about it saying, oh, he's very sustainably minded, very but does he do it in like an inexplicably, what I assume is a racist accent? <laughs> oh, does he? I don't know. He, if does, I he, that. Does, does he? he says it in a weird voice. I'm not going to replicate it now. Don't want to be. <laughs> don't do that. If it, if it was okay then, it probably. What I don't okay know. It's very strange what... at the very least. The one thing I don't understand about this part is that they're trying to establish Randy as being like the caring one, the one who's like caring about everybody's well being. He cares about the, the, the environment or whatever. <laughs> and then. One bad at... night's sleep, he becomes a like, Randy, one bad by, night's Randy sleep, by becomes... nature. He becomes a sex pest. It's just like, it's so strange and proper. Like, I, I was like, whoa, what's going on? I thought he was just going to roll her off initially. Yeah. That's what I thought he was going to do. It would have made more sense, right? Yeah. But no, he was like, I'm going to take this opportunity to tit her up. Anyway, okay. So, yeah, we'll, we'll get to it. But first, so um, our first victim, sorry, Ben, I've immediately, she's got the less, the late, the less memorable name. Rachel. Rachel, sorry, all the Rachels out there. I 
value and do remember your name in real life, but well, not in this good film. Because you not don't. In this instance. Obviously, Rachel, you don't strike me. This is Rachel, the listener, as a dickhead that would be eaten by a blob. This Rachel, unfortunately, is why it's such a disparity. So yeah, well, she, she put, to be fair, she, she puts her hands into, like... into pollution. Yeah, I mean, um, I don't think you would expect it to to eat you, would you? So I mean, I, I can't blame her for that. But yeah. on your hands, though, if there was a if there was no, a, if there was not. a scum floating about, and she's doing it with like she's got the cigarette right in the hand that she's using. So I was like, if it is an oil slick, will that ignite? Is that how it works? I don't know. Um, so yeah, she leans over to try and touch it and it just like grabs hold of her. It seems to like melt her arm immediately, doesn't it? Yeah, it's horrible. And, and it drags her in um, and everyone sort of panics. But this is kind of weird because obviously Randy's trying to reach for her. Deke's like pulling him back as if to say, no, she's gone. But I'm like, two seconds ago, you had no idea what this thing was. And now you're sort of, now you're, you've are you come to terms with the fact that it's killing people. It just Yeah, it and it's like bit... basically, even when she's still in there screaming, he goes, oh God, because it's horrible. He's like, it hurts, it hurts. Uh, it might be a knee when she bashed it still that she's talking about. I don't know for sure that it's the being eaten it's by the melting blob. me. I, I kind of got vibes. It was a bit like the blob, wasn't it? It kind of like, yeah. it, it, it digests you and melts you. Comes ever so sharp. Yeah, so is it, but Deke is very quick. So, she's dead, mate. She's dead. Yeah, it is proper. Like, he just gives up. She's dead. And then when, like, Ray, uh, sorry, Laverne is, like, panicking, he, like, grabs her and says, if you don't stop panicking, I'm going to smoke you. <laughs> smoke, yeah. Gives a, shows the, shows the fist. Like, Deke is not show. I mean, no one shows himself as having great character here, but. He's a Deekhead. Yeah, he's a right Deekhead. Deke by name, <laughs> Deke by nature as well. Yeah. So he's a right deek, and he yeah he threatens to give Laverne a a right thump in if she doesn't stop panicking, um, and then they start coming up with a plan. Yeah, so, I think initially to go oh it's off season, so there's no caretaker out here to rescue us. I'm like, well the blob would eat him as well, so who's, who cares? It's gonna get you. the blob. Um, it's off it's off season, so there's no one's gonna rescue us. But they they theorize that might be full up now. It might be full up, yeah. And then Deke's like, I'm going to make a swim for it. I'm I'm fast as fuck, all right? I'm going to make a bloody swim for it. Um, but before he can even, like, jump in, it comes up through the cracks in the raft, wraps around his foot, like, starts pulling him through. And again, it snaps him in half. Like, snaps him in half, yeah. But Randy's kind of, like, re- I mean, it's not that far away, but re- Randy's, like, reaching for him, like, Whoa, I'll save you. And it, yeah, it snaps him in half, makes his legs go a bit like it follows where the legs like the wrong yeah. way around in the killing in the first the first instance. Yeah, um, except the 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 blob, the the thing that doesn't have a name because the story is called the raft. It's not the raft. The it's blob. the opposite. It's the, yeah. I call slick it the, thing, the slick sl- slickman. The, the, yeah, yeah, slickman McRiver like basically slurps him off through there, snaps him in half, but not like the it follows. It doesn't fuck him to death. It just slurps him off. Yeah. Um, so yeah, now he's dead. Um, and then Laverne the jumps point? on Randy's back and he's like, Bloody get off! Oh, yeah, no, I yeah. can't. He's like, and you can see, stand. so their feet are like standing on the boards and it's like coming up through the cracks a bit, but it doesn't seem to be able to get them unless their feet are over the cracks, right? It has to literally be able to touch you, I think. It has to be able to touch you. So for some reason, that seems to work. But then they sleep on the raft at some point. So their back and their other parts of their body are are sort of there on, well, on sort the of, cracks. It, it comes away from being under the yeah. raft. So they're watching it and they're taking it in turns. Uh, yeah, they say, right. well, I'll tell you what, we'll, rather than do that, shall we just lie down together and we'll both kind of watch. We can both sit down instead of taking it in turns. both watch, yeah. Down. And obviously they're freezing as well because it's October and they're that we've got their clothes or, it's getting or cold clothes. yeah it's getting freezing as well so they, they kind of huddle together as well don't they um but yeah they eventually fall asleep in each other's arms and the next morning which is when they wake up i thought randy was going to shove her roll, off to try roll, and survive, roll, right roll her off and then try and survive but no he what looks like he's going to roll her off he starts lifting her top up kissing and caressing her naked body um, which is like it's just really like out of it felt really out of place. I, 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 if it was Deke, I think we'd have, we would have sort of established that maybe perhaps he was a bit of a, a, a douche. And a also, that's you know, not you know, not to conform to types of monogamy, Ben, between them, but that those two aren't a couple, 
both of their yeah, respective yeah, yeah. partners have been slurped off. I don't know human psychology, Ben. I'm not not Sigmund Freud over here. Maybe yeah. tra- maybe trauma seeing your girlfriend and your mate get slurped off by very specifically an oil slick like monster after a swimming trip and then a bad night's sleep. Maybe combine all those factors together, it does make you inexplicably horny. I don't know, <laughs> not a doctor. But that's what that's what's happened to Randy here. He's woken up and gone, that's what's, what's happened. my name again. Randy, play by that name, shall I? And he, like you say, touches a sleeping Laverne up. Um and as a little as a little go on her boobs while she's asleep. And God. and then I mean it appears to be that's the extent that like, you know, he's like, Oh, enough's enough, I guess. So that'll do. And he goes That'd to stand do. up. Only for Laverne to turn round and go, but his face has been melted off, idiot. Yeah, so it's like she was lying, sort of like on her side, and it, it was obviously getting to her. And then, yeah, her face was being melted off. And again, no one seems to be able to actually help anyone because they stand at arm's length, reaching for them. Oh my god, no. Um. So yeah, she it seeped through the cracks, covered half her face, and she's it just consumes her basically. But it's melting her down, pulling her into the water. Um, she and then in the, like in, in, skeleton, in the but... water she comes out as like a gummy skeleton yeah which looks delicious and then Randy goes right screw it I'm going to jump and swim to shore I will say it doesn't look like he's swimming because you put everything into it swimming as fast as you can it looks like he's kind of going oh, I've got to swim have I yeah I suppose so maybe he's just tired Um, and he manages to swim and then it chases him so we get a bit of tension with this oar slick thing like following him but Randy's an idiot sending. It's a great ending because Randy's an idiot because as soon as he gets like to the shore, he's merely inches away from the shore. I mean, it could reach out and grab him and touch him. And he goes, I beat you. I beat you. But no, it leaps out of the water, consumes like a big him, wave, like a big wave and just drags him back in. Um, Yeah. So we see like this. And the final shot is good because we see like the car running with the radio playing battery be dead. Uh, and and. The, yeah, and then we see a sign which is kind of like got some vegetation over it, and it says "no swimming." So if clearly, it someone the, if it hadn't been the off season and the caretaker was there, those bushes would have been trimmed, and they'd have seen the sign. And I think they still would have got in. Yeah, wouldn't they? Because they're they're, pro- they're 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 wrong uns. They're bloody wrong uns. Um. So yeah, that is the end of the second segment. I love. We... I I really like this one. I think it's such a fun again instant calm of the movie. <laughs> Instant karma of the movie, yeah. It is. I, I like this one as well. I like the characters, but I didn't. There was a little bit of inconsistency with perhaps Randy and the way he was portrayed. Um, but still, I think in terms of the body horror and the gory stuff, uh, and and as like a significant threat. And again, it's like people isolated somewhere. I think is always always makes for good, good horror as well. Yeah. I I wonder. And it's not the case. I'm not about to cast shade on this actor's good name. But can you imagine? This would have been one of those things that. Actually, a bit of trivia for you. That actor ad-libbed that bit. Originally, he was just going to push her into the water to survive, but then the actor said, wouldn't it be good if I uh, add a... Oh, add God. A, add a little... Um, I, I a, do have a little bit a little of trivia ba- based on that character, though. Do you want to hear it? Oh, go on. Tell me. Daniel Beer, his name is, who played Randy in the segment, almost died from hyperthermia. The water was so cold, his body turned green. A bit like yeah. Stephen King in the first one. They wanted him to continue acting, but he said... But he will walk off the set and never return. <laughs> Unless so I can. So they have took a kiss it. Wait. On, oh wait. No. No. Star. They said they want him to continue acting. If he if he walks off the set, he'll never return. So they took him to the hospital and he made a full recovery and he completed the segment of the raft. Um. Yeah. There we if go. If he walks um, off the set, he'll never return. He'll never come back. All right. He'll never come back. So we want him to. Okay. So then we go back to the animated interlude between segments. This is. Billy taking the Venus flytrap bulb back, but he's <laughs> attacked by a group of bullies who are all very, very different. Rhino, a big, like, Nelson Muntz type of... Is he the one with the cowboy boots or the spurs? Cowboy boots with the spurs. Um, and he's about 40 years old and then another sort of bunch of knobheads. I was annoyed by this, right? So they take his package off him and stomp on it. And, it, and Billy's little chin starts wobbling like he's going to cry. And I was like, oh, no. Um, but he kicks him in the nuts. Take that rhino. And then flees 
like such race such racing away on his bike and they go after him on his bike and do you, do you know what rhino says when he says get him oh yeah he wants his ass <laughs> get him i want his ass he does excuse me rhino <laughs> excuse me rhino um did you mean to say that yeah yeah i'm fine don't worry about it um he wants his ass which is which is you know yeah and he sends his unlikely sort of bully sidekicks as well i feel yeah. that these will all be victims of bullying there's like yeah. There's like sellotape glasses, tiny yeah. man. <laughs> sellotape, sellotape glasses, tiny man. Ginger fella. Yeah. Uh, and the, the other one is we- like... Weasley McScrawn. We- not Weasley McScrawn. He's the best of us. Um, <laughs> um, yeah. They, they they all chase him. But the creeper pops his head around. I was, oh, don't worry, everybody. Us, hmm. the audience. Don't worry. Billy knows his way about town. They won't. They won't catch him in a hurry. No. So, oh, yeah, that's what he in says, the meantime, boy. while he, while he's distracted, though, do you want to do you want another creep show? Yes, please. The yeah. creep. Yes, please. And this one is called the Hitchhiker. And as we mentioned before, Annie Lansing, who's in bed after getting her rocks off with a gigolo lover. Oh yes, a welcome. married. Welcome <laughs> to the sex industry pricing chat everybody the economic podcast for all of your needs six bloody orgasms 25 dollars per, orga- per orgasm um which meant she only paid him 150 dollars in 1987 money though that's oh uh, yeah okay all right, all right yeah. okay get yourself a brand new ford cortina for that that's true so she's an adulterous main businesswoman um and then she, she's obviously gone and slept with this fella while her husband is away, George, he's arriving home soon, so she needs to get home very quickly. So she gets alarm. She's late because the alarm has gone off. Because we get classic, oh, yeah, a problem that wouldn't happen these days. Modern phones, they they've woken up and the yeah, alarm the clock. clock is is flashing twelve, and she goes, "Blue hell, what time is it?" Um, this I mean, is it's... like home. This is like home alone. This is why they missed the f- the flight. Yeah, nearly missed the flight. That's why they had to rush because of the phone. Because of the clock, sorry. I mean, it adds a little bit of romance to your to your sexual transaction, I guess, that you're going to fall asleep in each other's arms afterwards, not be like, right, on your pop, got to change the seat before my next one's in. I've got I to. Feel like I, if I was a gigolo, though, I, I don't know how I, I feel about the, the the sleep. Am I getting paid extra for the little romantic sleep after that? I feel like if I'm doing the boyfriend experience... I mean, assuming if you're assuming that 150... Oh, it covers a certain you, amount of time. The hundred, the hundred and fifty dollars that you've made, though, is that a livable wage if you're doing that every day in 1987, whatever city they're in? Um, I, I guess he's not paying tax in a traditional way, so you know, government's not taking forty percent of that. No, well, there we go. Well, it's, it's it's a big question, but Annie doesn't have to worry about any of this for very long. Um, because <laughs> she's in our next a... spin-off episode where we'll be talking on a bite-sized episode about the economics of the sex industry. If you are a sex worker and would like to come and join us to talk about economics, hit us up on the socials. Yeah. Uh, yeah, exactly. We want to cover as much as possible. If we, ever, if we ever do it, if we have a character in Boo Year's Eve that is a sex worker, I want to make sure that our that our pricing <laughs> structure is as accurate to real life as possible. Oh, yeah, because if someone goes, oh, what? That's, that doesn't make sense. We want some of the smart answers, you know, yeah. picking our stuff apart. Please, no. We have to educate yeah. ourselves in this area, but you're right. She doesn't have to worry about it for long because she's more concerned about getting back and what excuse she's going to give to us. She's husband. driving home and she talks to herself a lot, doesn't she? I'm like, Annie, go on, yeah. she's just basically trying to convince herself that what, what did she say? It's basically I think, like... char- I think her character trait is everything is about money because that's why she says, you know, excellent value. Um, uh, okay. $20, $25 for <laughs> orgasm. That's right. And then she's also Excellent going value. She's going to do a do a Google review for that fella. Excellent. Yeah, she'll be one of those testimonials we were talking about. But then she's also sort of musing over aloud for us, for the benefit of us, the audience, as to what she's going to say. Well, he's already going to be home by now. Where am I going to say that I was? I'll be like, oh, I'll say I was out with um, Derek and Phyllis. No, I can't say that. I said I was out with them on Thursday. Oh, maybe I will say I was at the cinema. Oh, but what movie did I see? And then she muses to herself. I'll say, yeah, actually, I was off being sexually gratified and actually feeling alive for once in my bloody life. Oh, no. Um, Do it! And while um, she's thinking about that, though... She's thinking she just... about it. It's a cigarette that she that she 
like it she it like uh, some ash like falls off onto her lap or something. Are oh, like our cigarettes the downfall of everyone in this film? Uh I don't know. Did, did, does anyone smoke in the first bit? Chief wouldn't have uh, the Chief mascot wouldn't the cigarettes. Represents tobacco. This whole <laughs> film is an anti-smoking advert. Good on uh, so um, yeah, she she does that and she loses control while driving on a slippery corner and makes a meal of it. To be fair, turn into the, the biggest skid ever. It's like over to one side of the road, over to the other. The, yeah, that that skidding sound effect is getting a big workout. And then she sees a hitchhiker. As well, uh, I can only describe. First of all, I was like, is that one of those guys with the big signs who like does all the flips of it? <laughs> yeah, Pizza Hut this way. Whoa, Pizza Hut this way. Well, which way is it? And he's wearing a uh, he's wearing like a yellow Mac, like. Uh, What's his face from from it? <laughs> like kid. Georgie, yeah. Georgie, wearing a yellow Macintosh. Yeah, um, and he and she flattens him. She absolutely flattens him. Not absolutely kills him. Pancakes this fella. Kills him dead. Hit and run. She's like, oh no, screw that. I'm leaving. Drives off with her lights off. She's a bloody idiot though. You know what she could have said to her husband when she got back? So sorry, I'm 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 late. I ran a guy over. Yeah. So if it ended, but then it will get to the point where he goes, well, where were you? Where were you? And he was like, oh, I was just like driving, looking for people to run over. But she could have said, like, I'm sorry, I, I've blacked out, actually. It's been real stressful. Can you not ask me the bloody comings and goings of where I am? Because I've killed this man. <laughs> I've literally you know, just killed a a- a- Accidents happen. Maybe she's worried about no claims bonus. That's Probably true. Probably 1987. Yeah. You haven't got the additional service from the insurance industry where you can protect yeah. claims bonus. She's going to lose that. And she's very money focused. Mm. Um. <laughs> so she, yeah. So she drives off, like pretty much doesn't look back. Uh. And then, but everyone stops, like a truck driver, obviously played by Stephen King himself. Yeah. Who gets out and says, "Bloody hell, what's happened here?" A couple of passers by, and then a man who's got a, luckily got a phone in his car, and he manages to report the hit and run to the police. <laughs> Hello, nine one one. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, so I'd like to report a hit and run. Right yeah. now, I'm sure when you phone 911, they identify themselves by saying emergency. <laughs> Hello, and to who am I speaking? Doesn't... <laughs> <911? Yeah. laughs> doesn't, doesn't Stephen King also go, Oh, he's a black man as well, is he? This 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 guy that's been mowed, mowed down, <laughs> he's yeah, be creamed by this. Uh, he says creamed, he does say creamed. Um, so yeah, and then Annie obviously drives drives away, and she's convincing herself that she can live with it. Essentially, she's like, "Oh, can you live with this? Because if you can live with it, then that's it. You just you got to. Um, but if you can't, then does she say like, if you can't, you need to like go back or? Yeah, if you can't, but she she decides she can live with it. She's yeah, I can I, I can, can live with it. it. And she says um, like, oh, if you if you decide later that you want to feel guilty, you just come forward later, wouldn't you? Yeah. Just come forward. Um, and, w- and she stops for some reason. I can't remember exactly why. She... Traffic lights or something like that. And Traffic then lights. The fellow she sees behind, behind her. her. Yeah. And this is quite good because it's not like it's a bit silly. It's a bit like slapstick. Like this guy is dead. I mean, clearly it's not him. It's not a zombie. It's like the, the ghost of him, I guess. Uh, all like stumbling over saying, and keep saying over and over and over again. Thanks for the ride, lady. That's what he says. And before we know it, he's getting in through the... He's, well, she, he says it at the window. She goes screaming off. She <laughs> Then he's getting in through the sunroof. Feature for that car that she has. Yeah. Uh, and then she... Tell you what, though. It's not in the days where... Mod, modern car, Ben. You've got your hand in the window. You close it. It'll go, oh, there's a body part in there. <laughs> yeah. Don't do that. No, not on, not on these sunroofs. <laughs> he chops his little hand. So he's like getting more and more like battered. He's like, I mean, it's pretty horrific, like pretty gory. Um, and then she goes like driving through the woods, trying to like knock him off. She like eventually knocks him off with a low hanging branch. Yeah, she thinks that's dri- kind of it. Drives under a classic low log. It's like the Star yeah. Wars. It's like the Return of the Jedi. The chase <laughs> through Endor, Endor woods. Yeah, bashes him off with a big log. And then she. Like, oh, yeah, she rams, smashes his head against a tree over and over again, reversing, smash, reversing, smash, over and over until he's, like, mush, essentially. Yeah, he's and double then... creamed at this point. And then, like, passes out. I think she passes, I think she bangs her head, like, in one of the things, and then she wakes up and goes, oh, where am oh, I? Oh, better get home. Yeah, just a dream. Drives, manages to nav- navigate safely, like, just 
through the snow in the middle of the woods. She's driven down a massive. Oh yeah, it starts snowing as well, doesn't it? Randomly, doesn't it? It's like a Christmas miracle. Um, she she drives home having smashed this guy. I mean, we're going through it quickly, but it is just a series of action sequences, right? Where she thinks she's rid herself of the yeah, the hitchhiker. 100%. He comes back and says thanks for the ride, lady, and she smashes her car up more. Obviously, debating like, oh, three grand be good as new. And then at this point, she's like, oh, this is a write off, isn't it? Insurance isn't going to cover this. Yeah, um, it is a write off, definitely. And she's driven herself home, but she's glad of being rid of the hitchhiker. But as she gets yeah. back home and pulls into the garage one more time, he, she hears a very gurgly at this point. Thanks for the ride, lady. And she has a... yeah, yeah, he's, he's, in a bad... he's in a bad way. He's in a seriously bad way. Yeah, there's no salvage in it. Um, yeah, now he's got a sign as well that says "You killed me" rather than. Oh yeah, he sign. showed that letter, "You killed me," and then later, then in the is her husband comes down in the morning. Yeah, so obviously that happens when she gets home, and then she does she like shoot him in the face at some point as well. Like yeah, she pulls a gun out at one point as well because you know she's got a gun in the glove box. She blows him away a bit more. Then that's how his face is all gone. Maybe. Yeah. Um, but then, when he's finally got her in a garage, he off camera has <laughs> got her, and then in the morning, we see inside the car, and she's been got. So, what, but when, but when George finds her, when her husband finds her, the car's still running. So it says here that she died that she died from carbon monoxide poisoning. So, and the and the the bloody Dover sign sits in her lap. So you could believe. Here's what you could believe. You could believe that that all of that was a representation of her guilt from knocking him over, yeah. and when she got home, she decided to kill herself. Carbon monoxide poisoning. The hitchhiker never existed. It was all he in her head. Get, he did just get smushed on the wall. Very good. In that case, I've upped my rating of that one, like the little bit of a metaphor that perhaps I missed when I was watching it in a hurry yesterday. I mean, I'm not 100 percent sure. I'd, I'd literally oh, support that. Take it, second, Ben. That so. is that is a scholarly approach. Scholarly. To... All right. Very good. Yeah. I think, as I said, I think this was possibly the weakest of the three, just because I think it. I think when you're aware of the running time of 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 like a short like this, is when you realize perhaps it's not working so great. Even though it's action sequence after action sequence, I just felt like I was a bit like, oh, where's it going with this? Um, and then yeah, so probably the weakest of the three. But then we do get an epilogue like with the animated stuff as well. Um, we see the creep with the delivery truck. He bids the audience farewell, and we think it's the end of the film, but then we go, oh, mate, what happened to Billy? And it goes back to Billy, getting chased by the bullies, takes him into, like, some vacant lot, apparently. There's, like, loads Junk of... Junkyards. Yeah. Junkyard, yeah. And, but, and Rhino is about to... is about to get his ass. He's going to bloody put him in traction, he says. Yeah. So even though he's got that bowl... Bullies, like, yeah, do you think, you know, maybe, maybe it's not true. Do you think bullies in the 80s... Like, Go hospitalizing people. Surely that's a good way to get busted for being a bully. Well, I know, but you know, it, if we're meant to, how Stephen King writes bullies? So, forgot in... it was Stephen King, the most psychopathic <laughs> bullies in the world. <laughs> bullies are willing to pretty much kill people. Maybe it looks slightly foolish in class, did you? I'm gonna stab you to death. I'm gonna stab you, you bastard. Yeah. <laughs> so we're made to believe that it, this isn't the first giant Venus flytrap bulb that Billy had because all of these huge Venus meat eating Venus flytraps emerge and eat all of the fugs. The bullies. The bullies. Rhino has the best chance of getting like, some of them just get snapped up and swallowed down immediately. Rhino does like a great repeated <laughs> bit of animation where he's like trying to wedge the mouth open. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But then get snapped off his boot falling to the floor. Imagine getting eaten so hard that your shoe comes off. Yeah, I know. Disappointing. Yeah, not floor. much blood in these sequences. I thought like, if they had a bit of blood in the animated sequences, could have been a bit more. Could have been Do a little bit more this interesting. Is the same but... Billy that was that voodoo dolled his dad in chapter one of Creep Show, played by Joe Hill oh, himself. Yeah. Could have been. Son. Could have been. Why not? So Why now not? Billy is connectivity. I'm I'm all for that. Yeah. There's a creep show three that I don't remember at all. You have to watch it. Is there a creep show three? There's a creep show three. What? I don't know if I knew that. Um, okay. So that is that is you in two years, Ben, for creep show three. Yeah, two years exactly. Let's remember that. Uh so yeah, creep show three. Oh, 2006. So it was like uh much later. A much later one, yeah. Okay. Saying that, well, maybe do it in two years, but I might watch it like once I'm done with Fright Fest. I might watch creep. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, okay, so 
that was that. Have we got any name game? Um, I will be very honest with you. Have you got trivia? Um, I'll, I'll get very. I haven't got any trivia. You got any trivia to begin with? Uh, so in terms of the trivia, I already told you about him nearly bloody dying. So apparently a makeup artist called Ed French was supposed to play the role of the creep, but then he left the project, so Tom Savini stepped in. I don't Tom know Savini how... Tom Savini steps in so often on this. Remember he, he does, the yeah. End of, the end of the Cropsy. Yeah, directed it. Dire- that's right, isn't it? The last sequence, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Saves the day often, does Tom Savini. Yeah. I wonder how close to like the, the the start of filming that he went. Oh, I'll step in and be the creep. Obviously, they got a different voice in there because I didn't. Maybe he couldn't do the voice. I don't know. I'm not sure if it was like I'm not sure if there was ever an animated thing. I mean, a creep show is a comic. Maybe that was an existing animated voice. I'd have to look into it. Yeah, exactly. Um, okay. Have you got any name game? Did you say no? I've got a few. I can't. I can be very honest, Ben. I didn't audit this against when me and Luke did it. So if I have any repeats, I'm just going to say two at the yeah. end. Yeah. That's what I'm and thinking. Then, and that's what you've got. So <laughs> here's your first bit of um, Creepshow 2 trivia, then. Yeah. Not trivia, no, name game. So um, what's, the, what's the synopsis? And I'll go from there. Okay. So I guess it would just be an... Um, free macabre tales from the latest issue of a boy's favourite comic book. Just keep it at that. In that case, the first one. Three more macabre tales of Mark and Jeremy, two thirty-somethings living in London. We've definitely done this, surely, or did I do it accidentally? <laughs> accidentally. Um, accidentally. It's Peep Show Two. Peep Show Two, correct. Uh, okay, I've got one, and it's and it kind of is a lot about to take into take into good mind the instant karma nature of a lot of these stories. Okay. Um, so free macabre tales all focusing on instant karma where somebody does something and immediately gets their just desserts. What would be a <laughs> a turn of phrase to represent that? I feel like if I say too much, then oh, and it rhymes so, with creep show. It rhymes with creep show, yeah. So you duh what you duh. Oh, you reap what you sow too. Correct. It's reap sow too. Reap, reap slash sow too. That's how we reap slash sow too. That's correct. Reap slash sow too. Okay. Here's a, another one. Um, three macabre tales that actually, much like the anti tobacco lobbying of this film, this one tries to cut down in um, noise pollution by forbidding any road users from sounding their horns. Beep, no. Beep, no, too. Because <laughs> sometimes, right, using your horn is actually more dangerous than not using it. Yeah. See, oh, especially when you're trying to alert someone of danger, Ben, or a cheerful hello, that's fine. But when it's oh, like, yeah. you didn't pull off this roundabout as fast as I, the person behind you, would like you to, <laughs> um, I'm going to beep, yeah. Say, or like, oh, what's that? I'm driving towards someone a bit too fast and I've had to slow down. Yeah, mate. Rage. Instead, instead of your hand on the horn, use your foot on the brake and stick the other one up your ass, mate. Tell you what. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Well, I know. I never. I never knew you felt so strongly. Oh, about oh this. I hate being beeped. In it. <laughs> so oh yeah, it's annoying. It is annoying. Makes you want to just um, reverse into them, and then yeah, oh, unless they're a much bigger person than me, then I wouldn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> Battered. Only small people. Yeah. Okay, I've got another one. So, three macabre tales from a latest issue of a boy's favorite comic book. One of which is based on a very famous UK band playing their biggest hit. Biggest hit. Um, I'm going to say, I'm going to call them a 90s band. Probably came to fruition in the 90s. Playing their, <laughs> playing their biggest hit and a song that apparently they don't even like playing live anymore. But they're, So they've started playing it at 50% speed. The BPM has gone right down. <laughs> is it creep slow? Creep slow, correct. Quite a slow song, anyway. So, oh, 50%? can you imagine? <laughs> Bloody hell! Bloody hell! Almost unlistenable. Um, <laughs> so, um, in preparation for his Burns night dinner, a Scottish man grows some turnips in his garden. Uh, is it neeps? 
Yeah, neeps and what ne- neeps, doing. And, neeps and tatties. Um, neeps grow. Neeps grow. Very good. Neeps grow too. <laughs> neeps grow is neeps and tatties, right? That's correct. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Uh, there we go. Is that it? Um. Yes. Let's call. Yeah, it. Yes. <laughs> I don't think there's much. I don't think there's much more trivia. Really, that's what that's all that interesting. I think it was the last appearance of the actress who played. Um, what's her name in the first segment? Uh, oh, Dorothy Lam. Oh no, sorry. It was Dorothy Dorothy Lama's first film appearance in eleven years, but it also turned out to be her final one because she passed away in 1996 at the age of oh. 81. Very sad, yeah, especially as I've now irreversibly entwined her with that character. She's a nice old lady. Just a nice old lady, yeah. Uh, there we go. So now we need to rate the film. Rate good or rate bad? A to F. Minuses and pluses are allowed. Uh, how are you feeling about this? I mean, I, I don't know if you remember how you rated the first one either. Um, I don't remember my rating at the time of the first one. I'd have to go back to the archives and have a little look. But yeah, I do agree with the review we read that said it's maybe not as strongly iconic as the as as the first one. But for its era, especially, I enjoyed this. There's some fun to be had with it, and I especially liked um just. But I think where Creepshow does its best work in both instances so far are the bits that you can almost chop out as comic panels. It does really well at having just like iconic individual shots or moments. So in the first one, we had the guy with the birthday cake. We had, um, you know, the scene of uh, uh, Ted Danson's head sticking out of the sand and then Leslie Nielsen's towards the end saying how long he can hold his breath. In this one, yeah. we get... You know the the visual of the of Chief Woodenhead with the with the scalp. We get <laughs> the um, the wave of the, the in the raft from from the slick, or the image of Rachel. Um, you know, sticking her arm out as she's being melted away in the thing. This really, yeah, and, and that the, is a good and, shot. It is a good and, shot. And, and then the last piece, the woman in the back of the car, the guy saying thanks for the lift as he leans in the window. It's really good at coming up with single horror visuals. And then mapping it into a story mm-hmm. as well. I think it does a fantastic job of translating what is meant to be a comic book because of the way that they function into yeah. those stories. I think your mileage of the stories may vary. It's never going to be um, particularly complex unless, like Ben, you can see past the surface to the anti-tobacco lobbying and um, <laughs> uh, and the whole piece on guilt on the third one. But these yeah. are enjoyable stories. I love a horror anthology. How did so- you feel about them being yeah, having three stories instead of five as well? That's okay. I think I think anthology three plus your wraparound is fine. On, in yeah, I've, I, I I almost feel like it's a little bit easier to digest when it's like that. I think five can. I think five. You get to a point where you where you're at four and you're like, oh bloody hell, another one. Yeah, exactly. I think for for me, best angle you can get on a on an anthology three stories a wraparound that that links them together in a serious or just throwaway way as you like. Yeah. Perfect, perfect numbers for me. You know what? You've got five, you've got five mm. stories ready for your anthology, Ben. Think of it this way. That's, that's two thirds of your next one done. You've almost done two. Come on. There we go. Do that's one more. You've got a second one. That's a um, good way of looking at yeah, it. You know, do, do that. That's the perfect measure for me. So I'm going to rate it maybe more highly than you would expect this. Cause I think it's just an enjoyable thing. I'm really going to give this a classic, Ben Errington rating of a B minus. A classic Ben Errington. I thought it was a classic Luke Condor rating, but maybe I'd do that as well. Who knows? No, I find, I call, I, we'll give it a Luke Condor. We'll give it a B minus. I hate to be the person who always agrees with you, Andy, especially as your co host. There's literally, there's rarely any any confrontation between us or any. What word am I thinking of? There's, there's never. Yeah, we're, we're always we're, in agreement. We're, we're in sync, simpatico. We're in sync, but I think B minus is fair because I was going to go for a B, but I think maybe a B minus is is fair because it's maybe yeah, like slightly less iconic than the original one, and because it hasn't got as big names in it, it's probably going to be a bit less memorable. And also that third story, I felt outstayed its welcome just a little bit, but I think the first two were 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 solid, and I do like the the wrap around and the whole section of this i've never watched a tv show on shudder have you there was a tv show of creep show no i do mean to watch that i'm gonna watch um, you've set me going i'm gonna watch creep show three first and then i'm gonna watch both the animated christmas one and oh, wow, the new okay. series nice yeah so b minus for me as well i think there we go then 
Uh, yeah, that was creep show everybody. too. Yeah, thanks for joining us, everyone. If you enjoyed the show, please become a patron over at patreon.com forward slash horror hangout. Thanks to our current patrons, including John Crin and Ben Scaife, Stephen Christopher, Toby Miller, Scott Rigby, Lane Spencer, Ollie Child, Leslie Carlo, Julia Bilger, Nick Spill, Troy Birch, Rosalind Harnias, and Pazuzu. Thanks to Taj Easton for our theme music. Thanks to ACAST for hosting the show. Please consider giving us a rating or review and head over to the Facebook group Horror Hangout Board of Advisors for more. We're on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok. Just search Horror Hangout Podcast. Uh, next week, we're doing Peeping Tom. Peeping Tom, just before we head off to Fright Fest, Ben. Oh, my God, yeah. we're gonna. It's gonna literally going to be... We've hit stop recording on that and then leave leave the room. Yeah, get on the road. Get on the oh, bloody road, exactly. Thanks, everybody. See you for some the origins of what slasher movies, right? Yeah, exactly. I've never seen it either. Yeah, then looking forward you to it. Join me. us again next time, everybody. Bye for yeah. now, though. Join us again. We'll see you very soon. Take care. Watch out. Don't let karma get you because it does so instantly. Bye for now. It does. Don't smoke. Bye. Bye. <laughs>